it's entirely possible for us to claim to follow Jesus without ever being deeply formed by Christ. Our pace can be too fast to be in true union with God, and we don't know how to quiet our hearts and minds to be present. Our emotions can be unhealthy and compartmentalized. We can feel unable to love well or to live a better way, differently from the rest of the world, to live as people of the good news. The deeply formed life centers on five key values. Contemplative rhythms, racial reconciliation, interior examination, sexual wholeness, and missional presence that will help us be deeply formed by Jesus to restore balance, focus, and meaning for our souls. Growing up in Grand Rapids, my family and most of the community I interacted with were of Dutch heritage. I grew up with an elementary school friend in first grade named Dirk and a high school classmate named Leisha. Those sorts of names were common to me with all the Dutch people who surrounded me. You see, I was surrounded by a people of, community of people really, who loved Jesus and who largely lived their lives with people with similar backgrounds and similar values. And as a kid, I loved it. The relative sameness and similarity of the people around me was all I knew and it was comforting and it was familiar. Upon arriving at Michigan State University for graduate school, I started getting lab experience through a temporary period where I was assigned to a laboratory where I was the only native English speaker, <laughs> the only one. And I quickly realized that I had no clue what one of my lab mates was saying because his English was so heavily accented. I didn't have any experience with people who spoke English as a second language. And I really wanted to communicate and I wanted to understand him. In fact, I needed to do it, to learn and to do what needed to be done in the lab, but that desire, it wasn't enough. I lacked experience. And what I realized through my time at MSU is that it's hard to love other people well if you've never had the experience of actually loving different types of people. MSU opened me to a, a whole world of different ethnicities and languages and faiths that well, I had heard about, but I'd never fully experienced before. And it was both really difficult and really helpful for me to be the only native English speaker in that laboratory. And after growing up with sameness, I was the other, the person who was different. Wow, and it, it was difficult for me to connect at first, but I worked at it. And my life, I think, is better for it. And I hope that through those efforts, other people's lives are better for it too, because I'm better able to give and to receive from people who are different than me. Today, we are continuing in our series, The Deeply Formed Life. We're finding throughout this series that in order for God to transform every part of our being, we can't settle for a shallow, skim the surface sort of spirituality. So together, we're growing our roots deeply into Jesus and God's way of life. Now, in order to get there, we have to be willing to challenge long-held beliefs and behaviors, even the ones that still may be locked in our heads, to, to ensure that we are truly following the way of Jesus. Now, the sad truth is that too many Christians are living lives that are indistinguishable from those who aren't following Jesus. Too many of us who claim to follow the ways of Jesus live with unconscious biases and, well, sometimes even deeply ingrained racist beliefs. Now, too many of us continue to benefit from systems that oppress our Bill Pock brothers and sisters and look the other way. And I've heard from Bill Pock friends that the reluctance to take a stand in solidarity is often more painful than overt racism. Now, these realities remind us that it's possible to be committed to the external activities of Christianity without being deeply transformed by Christ. As pastor and author Rich Velotis, whose book helped inform this series, says, instead of being deeply formed, we settle for being shallowly shaped. Here's the truth. God is not interested in transforming some parts of you and leaving the rest of you untouched. 
God's desire is to transform every single part of you until, as the Apostle Paul puts it, Christ is formed in you. This kind of transformation that we're after, it's not easy. Jesus' way was offensive to the world around him and challenging to his disciples. And even so, as we will see today, Jesus' followers leaned into a new way of living. And that's what we hope that you will also do today. Now, last week, we talked about contemplative rhythms. We talked about slowing down our pace of life and rooting ourselves in God's love. This week, today, we're talking about racial reconciliation. In a world marked by fragmentation and by racial division, we're going to hear today a vision of what it looks like when the gospel, the good news of Jesus, gets a hold of a people. When the gospel gets a hold of an individual. When the gospel gets a hold of a community, bearing witness to the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Let's pause a moment for a question about the gospel. It can be hard to pin down, so I want to give you a chance to first define the gospel. Here's our question. When you hear gospel, what comes to mind? How would you briefly define it and what it means? Let's take a moment and discuss that. I'm going to start by focusing on the gospel. The degree to which we understand the gospel will determine the degree to which we give ourselves to racial reconciliation. So if the gospel is exclusively the message that you're going to heaven when you die, well, one can easily conclude that race, racism, and racial reconciliation can be an afterthought. If the gospel is about the forgiveness of sins, or particularly personal forgiveness of sins, and that's how we exclusively look at the gospel, well, then it becomes permissible to ignore things like race and racism and racial reconciliation. So the question is, what if the gospel is something more? Yes, the gospel does involve the good news of eternal life through Jesus. Yes, we do receive forgiveness of sins because of God's love shown through Jesus. But what if the gospel has something to do not just with the life to come, but with our life right now and the ways that we relate to one another? What if we have a bigger definition and understanding of the gospel that includes all the usual things? Yes, but it's more than that. What if the gospel is the good news that the kingdom of God has come near in Jesus Christ and that in his life, teaching, death, resurrection, and enthronement, the powers of sin and death no longer have the last word? That's the gospel. And if that's the gospel, then we get to be part of forming this reality, this beautiful reality of a new family made up of a vastly different people. It's through the gospel that a new family made up of vastly different people, is possible through Jesus Christ. This is what revolutionized the world 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Paul is trying to help these folks in this church understand what has happened in Jesus. And Paul begins by talking about the ways Jesus Christ has rescued us. He writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved." Paul is saying that the problem with the human condition is not that we're morally inconsistent people. The problem isn't that we just mess up kind of here and there. That's much too optimistic a picture of the human condition. Paul says the issue is that we're dead and that we need to be made alive in Jesus Christ. Is the gospel is not just the good news that bad people can become good or even that good people can become better. The good news of the gospel is that dead people can be made alive. And this life can be tasted right now by saying yes and putting our trust in Jesus Christ. But Paul doesn't stop there. Paul continues, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two 
thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Paul begins by talking about how God has made us alive in Jesus Christ. We have access through Jesus to this thing called salvation. And in Christ, we have access to God. In Christ, we are made whole where we are broken. In Christ, we are set free. In Christ, we are forgiven. In Christ, we are rescued. And through Jesus, we are sons and daughters of God, a part of God's family with all the privileges of being a child. But that's not all. Paul lets us know that salvation has a vertical dimension, yes, but it also has a horizontal dimension. And salvation has to do with our relationship with God, yes, and it has to do with our relationship with one another. Now, here's Paul's train of thought. We have peace with God, and in Christ, we additionally have peace with one another. Just as the barrier between us and God has been removed, so too the barrier has been removed between us. So here's the point. A Christianity, a following of Jesus that only focuses on free access to God through Jesus without focusing on the walls that separate us from each other is not true Christianity. Let me put that another more provocative way. The cross is not just a bridge that gets us to God. It's a sledgehammer that tears down the walls that separate us. It's a nice image that we can connect with God through Jesus. And it's an incomplete image. The cross isn't just a bridge between God and humanity. It's a sledgehammer that tears down the walls that separate us. I find this image a little unsettling. Maybe you do too. But we need to do some demolishing of the systems, of the barriers that are wrong. We need to strongly oppose divisions. We need to be willing to be disruptive. And that begins with Jesus. It continues within and with us. And maybe the gentler way to think about this is using the four circles image. We've, we've used this image before at Sycamore Creek. And the bottom left circle on this illustration is a reminder that through the gospel, we are restored by God for good. We are to go into the world and bring about healing and justice. Now, as Paul writes about in Ephesians 2, God is not interested in simply saving individuals. God is interested in forming a new people, a new humanity, a new way of belonging to one another. And we get to be a part of that. Let's pause to digest and discuss this expanded idea of the gospel. Here's our next chat question. What do you think of the idea that the cross is a sledgehammer? that tears down walls that separate us. Does it resonate with you or not? Let's take a moment and discuss that. What Paul wrote was staggering when he wrote it 2,000 years ago. The walls between Jews and non-Jews or Gentiles were huge. And despite these tremendous barriers, something happens in Christ Jesus. We're brought together, despite our differences, to become one new family. In Christ, it's possible to have a new way of relating to one another. And yet, there's a problem. Sin, missing the mark, brokenness, it's still at work. Instead of living into this beautiful image of a gospel, of a, of a new family, where instead we find ourselves stuck. And this is a problem here in the United States, and this isn't just an out there problem in the rest of our culture here. The church is stuck. It's often been said pretty accurately that the most segregated hour of the week is 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings when people are in church worshiping. Ouch. The gospel calls us to break through, to show what's possible when Jesus is at the center. And further compounding this challenge is that just because a church is diverse, it doesn't mean it's a reflection of God's kingdom. We have room to grow in our spiritual emotional, and relational maturity. It's possible to be together and yet divided. There are always walls, always barriers remaining to be dismantled and taken down. Now, we've seen a lot of divisions over the past few years at the intersection of race and politics. And at times, to be involved in fighting racism has been viewed as politics. And let me be clear, to say Black Lives Matter it's not a political statement for our church. It's a theological statement. It's that black men, women, and children are to be treated with the greatest of human dignity, fairly, and with love. 
Black Lives Matter is a theological statement. So what does it mean to be committed to racial reconciliation? What are the signs that we are all in on the gospel of Jesus Christ? Not just a part of it, but the whole. What does it mean to take down walls? Well, let's start with the word reconciliation. It's a beautiful word, but it's often seen culturally as something much less than it is biblically. When people hear reconciliation, they often think of a diverse group of people gathering together and singing, and they think, wow, look at how reconciling this community is. The problem with that is you can get that at a Beyonce concert. A whole bunch of people singing and knowing the words to the songs. Reconciliation is more than people singing next to one another. It's much more profound than that. Listen to how Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil defines reconciliation. She says, Reconciliation is an ongoing spiritual process involving forgiveness, repentance, and justice that restores broken relationships and systems to reflect God's original intention for all creation to flourish. That's good. Let this be our understanding of reconciliation. It's ongoing for the rest of our lives. It won't be completed this side of heaven. This is the ongoing work through Christ that Paul wrote about. The walls of hostility coming down. So what does that look like? Well, let me give you some signs that this is happening, that reconciliation is occurring, and that the sledgehammer of the cross is breaking down our human barriers. First, the first sign of reconciliation is that we normalize the complexity of being in this new family. This stuff is complicated. Even in the midst of sameness, there are areas where we have things in common and yet we have differences. Now imagine getting a bunch of people together who are different economically and ethnically and with different experiences and with different backgrounds. It gets complicated really quickly. There will be conflicts that emerge. And we have at least two options in the midst of this conflict. One option is to say, this is an unhealthy community. Look at all the disagreements. Look at the tensions. But another option is to say, this is a human community. There are more people, and therefore there are more problems. This is normal and expected. And what this means is that as we reach a diverse group of people and do more than just sing together, someone is not going to be happy. If complexity is the normal, then we need to be humble and teachable. We are to be curious because we all have blind spots and we all need one another to help us to navigate this complexity together. I think for myself, I'm learning and growing all the time in my understanding of people with backgrounds and ethnicities that are different from my own. I'm a Dutch kid from Grand Rapids who grew up in a Dutch Christian Reformed culture. I need help. I need help in learning and growing. I need people who are willing to correct me and teach me and help me to navigate the complexity of this new family that we have in Christ. I need help. I can't do it by myself. And you need help. We all need help. We can't do this alone. It's too complicated. So first of all, we normalize the complexity of being a part of this new family. The second sign of reconciliation is that we explore our own racial formation. We've all been formed by our families. We've been formed by our relatives. We've been formed by our culture. We all have internalized messages about different groups of people who don't look exactly like us. We have ideas about people who come from other parts of the world than where we came from. We all have to wrestle with this and grow in our awareness. Now, we all have standards, too, for, for what is beautiful and what is not, for who is trustworthy and who is not, who, who is competent and who is not. And so much of this is racialized. And it's so second nature to us that if we're not working hard to identify the ways that we've been shaped, then we will perpetuate the fragmentation and the hostility that defines our world. My family consciously and unconsciously handed down messages to me about other people. And your family did this too. And unless I'm willing to sift through those messages and identify them and set some of them aside, 
I will not live out this vision from Ephesians 2. And neither will you. The challenge of this examination is that it can lead to shame because when we actually name the ways that we see different people, it can feel shameful. It's embarrassing. So we often avoid it. But part of the work of reconciliation is to confess the places where we have gotten it wrong. We don't ignore this. We don't set it aside. We deal with it. So here's some homework for you. Yes, yes, I'm giving you homework today. Please do this. Take time to do this. This is the sort of work that we do together in CORE, Communities Organizing for Racial Equity. It's the difficult work of identifying and tearing down barriers. And it begins with each of us and it extends to how we relate to each other. I'd like all of us to participate together in this gospel work. So I want you to write this out at home or, or talk to someone about it. How did your family talk about these groups below? What messages, spoken or unspoken, did you receive about black people, about white people, about Asian people, and that includes East Asian, Southern Asian, Asian American, all of those groups, Latino, Latina, Hispanic people, Native American people, Middle Eastern people. You see, this is where it begins to become apparent what our gospel really is. What do you do when you see someone different than you coming toward you on the street? What do you do when your new doctor has a name that you can't pronounce? Here are a few additional questions for us as homework. Who are the people that you were taught to fear and why? Who are the people that you were taught were beneath you? And finally, what assumptions about the groups of people listed above do you hold? Now, if we just truthfully and seriously do this one exercise this week, we will begin to live more fully into the vision of the gospel that Paul presents us with in Ephesians 2, where the walls of hostility come down. And if you say you just get along with anyone and everyone and you don't have any assumptions, I'm calling you on it. That's not true. This exercise requires us to examine our own racial formation. And here's the third thing. We lament and resist the racial sins that continue to shape our world today. To be a community that wrestles with racial reconciliation requires us to lament the ways that racism has damaged our world. Now, I just used the word racism. Let's take a moment and define that. It's probably a good idea to do that, isn't it? And just like the gospel, it's way much more comprehensive than what we might typically understand. Michael Emerson, a sociologist at Baylor University, tells us that racism is usually defined as intended individual acts of overt prejudice and discrimination. And what happens is, well, we say if we're not doing intended individual acts of prejudice or discrimination, then we don't have a problem with racism. Racism is more than this, though. There are layers to it. And Professor Daryl Wing Sue is a professor of psychology at, and education at Columbia University. And they give us a way more comprehensive definition of racism. Racism comprises attitudes, actions, institutional structure or social policies that subordinate persons or groups because of their color. To talk responsibly about racism, we must look at it individually, interpersonally, and institutionally. Only then can we address the demon of racism. It's when we address and begin to peel back all the layers that we really begin to bear witness to the gospel and to the gospel work of reconciliation that Paul calls us to. In Ephesians 2, we're making one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. If we're going to take racism seriously, we, we have to face difficult truths about ourselves and about our history as a nation. We can't move forward until we take a hard look at where we've been. We have to go back in order to go forward. We have to acknowledge the impact of Native American genocide, of slavery, of Jim Crow laws, of Japanese internment camps, of the origin in our country of anti-other sentiment, of police brutality, of redlining and housing discrimination. And as we name these things and recognize them, we resist these things today in the name of Jesus. Acknowledging our past and working together for something better, this is God's redemptive work that we're joining in. And here at Sycamore Creek Church, we're going to join our voices and with whatever power we have, we're going to join with those who are mistreated or overlooked or under-resourced. 
As we join in God's redemptive work, that might mean marching. That might mean voting. That might mean using our voice to point out difficult truths, to lament and to resist the racial sins that continue to shape our world today. Now, maybe this is all new to you and you're not sure about it right now. A next step for you could be to think about this more and begin to get your head wrapped around it. And maybe you've thought a lot about everything I've just said and you have some ideas of what God is calling you to do. Or maybe you're unsure about all this and your role in it, but you'd like to explore it further by attending one of our core workshops. Or maybe you have some reading and some reflecting to do. Wherever you are today, this is a working out of the gospel that God calls us toward. And I want to give us a moment to reflect on that. So here's our next question for discussion. What is one practical thing that you can do to lament and resist the racial sins that continue to shape our world today? Let's take a moment and discuss that. A fourth sign of reconciliation is that we practice repentance, repair, and forgiveness. If we're going to be a people marked by Ephesians 2, then we're making one new humanity, right, out of the two, thus making peace. And so to be deeply formed by reconciliation means continually practicing repentance, repair, and forgiveness. A regular confession is part of a deeply formed life. It orients us through a reminder that we, we all fall short. It reminds us that we don't have our act together all the time. It reminds us that we need the grace and mercy of Jesus. So we confess the areas where we have missed the mark and we repent and we turn towards something better. We're going to fail in community. We're going to not get it right. And we need a community where we can fail, where we can repent, we can repair, and then we can experience forgiveness. When this is our posture in life of repenting again, and again, and again, and then we repent of our blind spots. We don't know it all, and we never will. We repent of our insensitivity. We repent of our stereotypes. We repent, and we repent, and we repent. And along with our repenting, we repair. We repair, and we repair, and we repair. We work to make things right. We bring about peace and we bring about wholeness by repairing the damage that we've done. And then, and then by God's grace, we forgive. By God's grace, we don't carry the burden of resentment. We receive and we offer forgiveness. We repent, we repair, and we forgive. When we bring together people here at Sycamore Creek Church who come from different and diverse backgrounds and perspectives and ethnicities, We expect that they're, well, they'll be better formed in Christ through those differences. And we expect there will be conflict as we do that work together of being formed in Christ. In order for a church to be healthy and full of life in Christ, we're going to be deeply formed by practicing repentance, repair, and forgiveness. To live out this vision for Ephesians 2 of a community deeply formed by the gospel and given to reconciliation there's one final sign. That's that we cling to Jesus. Christ is our peace. We can't focus on what we're talking about today without focusing on what we talked about last week. If you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to go check out Contemplative Rhythms. Our lives are to be rooted in prayer, in a relationship where we are clinging to Jesus. Something has happened through Jesus' life, teaching, death, and resurrection. Something has happened through the descending of the Holy Spirit. Because of Jesus, a new world has been born and is being born. And so we cling to Jesus. And through some holy mystery, Jesus transforms us and our lives. And what we're doing here in all that I've been talking about today is following Jesus. We cling to Jesus for us to be deeply formed. And we recognize that real peace, real wholeness, it's not going to originate from us, but from Jesus. It's centered on Jesus, that we can be a community marked by love and repentance and forgiveness and wholeness and justice and reconciliation. So may we go forth today living in the power of the Holy Spirit. May we be deeply formed toward reconciliation with one another as we cling to Jesus together.